Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This webinar is supported by Akibia Therapeutics, and we thank them for their support. My name is Molly Alawade, and I'm the Director of Education here at the American Kidney Fund. Based on the feedback that we received from you, this webinar will focus on anemia and kidney disease. Before I turn the presentation over to today's speaker, I'd like to direct your attention to the control panel you should see on your screens. All participants are on mute, so we won't hear you, but we welcome your questions. If you have a question, please type it into the section of your control panel titled Questions. We'll see your questions and we'll do our best to answer them, either by replying to you in the questions box or out loud during the last several minutes of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available for viewing on our website, kidneyfund.org slash webinars, within the next one to two weeks. For those of you in attendance who are health professionals, we are glad that you've joined us today and hope you'll recommend this webinar to the patients you work with. However, as a friendly reminder, this webinar is not accredited for continuing education credits. If you believe that your accrediting body may offer you credits for attending this webinar, we'll be happy to send you a certificate of attendance after today's session. Simply email us at education at kidneyfund.org. Without further ado, allow me to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Jay Wish. Dr. Jay Wish is the Professor of Clinical Medicine at the Indiana University School of Medicine in Indianapolis and Chief Medical Officer of Dialysis Services at Indiana University Health. He has been an advisor to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services on quality improvement issues in dialysis, serving as chairman of the End-Stage Renal Disease, or ESRD, Clinical Performance Measure Quality Improvement Committee from 1998 to 2006. He was also lead nephrology consultant to the Fistula First Breakthrough Initiative from 2009 to 2012. He has numerous publications in the areas of ESRD quality oversight and improvement, accountability, vascular access, and anemia management. Thank you, Dr. Wish, for joining us. Thank you for the very kind introduction, and uh, we'll talk about anemia for the next 40 or so minutes, uh, an area of particular interest to me. You can see on this slide, uh, our objectives are going to be to define anemia, describe exactly how we make the diagnosis, what are the symptoms of anemia uh, that affect patients with chronic kidney disease, but also may affect uh, patients with anemia who do not have chronic kidney disease. How does chronic kidney disease cause anemia? As you will see, there's a very high prevalence of anemia among patients with chronic kidney disease that increases with the severity of the disease, so that by the time you get to end-stage renal disease and require dialysis, over 90% of patients have anemia. And then finally, we'll talk about the treatment of anemia, which by and large is very, very effective. In the next slide, I'm seeing if I can do this. Okay, uh, anemia happens when there are not enough red cells in your body. Basically, the red cells, as you know, bind to oxygen, the hemoglobin molecule that makes the red cells red, binds to oxygen in the lungs, and then carries that oxygen to your tissues. So that if you have fewer red blood cells, that decreases the ability to deliver oxygen to your tissues to meet the demand. And this will affect particularly those tissues that are very oxygen dependent, such as your muscles, your heart, and your brain. So because anemia leads to lower oxygen delivery, most patients will have symptoms that affect these particular organs. And in particular, the muscles and the brain, which gives you a sense of fatigue and decreased exercise tolerance. In the next slide, you can see in a diagrammatic way on the left-hand side of the slide what happens in a normal patient where you have plenty of those red cells where you see those circles with the little kidneys in them, but a patient with anemia on the right side has fewer red cells and therefore less oxygen delivery that ultimately affects the ability of the tissues to function properly. Next slide shows how anemia is diagnosed, as we mentioned, Hemoglobin is the molecule in red blood cells that, carry, that carries oxygen. And we generally diagnose anemia based on a lower hemoglobin content in the blood. So this is the primary blood test that we use to assess a patient for anemia and ultimately to make the diagnosis. There are some older tests that have been used that you may hear uh, the term hematocrit 
hematocrit was a, a pretty much uh, abandoned test. I mean, we still get a hematocrit value, but we don't, generally don't use it. That represents if you put blood in a centrifuge, what percentage of the tube is occupied by red blood cells as opposed to the liquid portion of blood after the blood is spun around for a while. But again, this is nowhere near as accurate a test as hemoglobin, and that's why we generally use hemoglobin uh, now. Next slide, please. Now, the normal hemoglobin level for a man, as you can see, is somewhere between 14 and 17, and the normal hemoglobin level for women is somewhat lower at 12 to 15. And if you're curious why men have higher hemoglobin levels, it's because male sex hormones stimulate the bone marrow to make more red blood cells. And if any of you were around uh, getting dialysis or being treated for anemia before we had erythropoietin in 1989, you may recall that one of the agents that we used was called decadurabolin, and this was an intramuscular injection that the patients got about every week, and this was, in fact, a male sex hormone that stimulated the bone marrow to make red blood cells. Another reason why women have lower hemoglobin levels is because they menstruate and lose blood in the menstrual fluid, and as a result, they become anemic on that basis. Now, anemia is defined as a hemoglobin that is lower than the lower limit of normal. And as we said, with men, the, limit, the normal range is 14 to 17, so anemia is generally defined as a hemoglobin less than 13, and in women, a hemoglobin of less than 12 constitutes the definition of anemia. Next slide. Now, why does anemia cause symptoms? We've already touched on this because hemoglobin is essentially re uh, required to carry oxygen to the tissues. The lower hemoglobin level decreases the oxygen delivery and makes it more likely that some of these symptoms uh, will occur. Now, if you have multiple other medical conditions that also can contribute to similar symptoms, such as fatigue and loss of exercise capacity, uh, then the anemia will compound the symptoms, and one may have more symptoms at a higher hemoglobin level than a patient who does not have some of these other illnesses. But most patients with anemia generally do not complain of these typical symptoms until their hemoglobin is less than 12. So just being anemic with a hemoglobin in the 11 to 12 range for most patients does not necessarily cause symptoms. And if the hemoglobin level falls gradually rather than suddenly, it's also less likely that the patient will have symptoms because the patient kind of adapts to the lower hemoglobin level and can actually extract more oxygen from the hemoglobin that they have. But below 11, it becomes impossible to compensate. And at that point, symptoms are almost inevitable. Next slide. This summarizes some of the more common symptoms of anemia, and you can see uh, we have little uh, emojis to help you uh, remember what they are. Uh, the number one and most common symptom of anemia is, as we mentioned, tiredness, weakness, and low energy level. But of course, you don't have to have anemia to have those kinds of symptoms. You know, there's many days where I wake up tired and weak and low energy level, and I'm not anemic. Uh, so again, remember that many of these symptoms are nonspecific and can be caused by other diseases as well. Shortness of breath is very common because essentially with the low hemoglobin level, your tissues are kind of starving for oxygen because there's less hemoglobin to deliver oxygen to the tissues. And this sends a message to the brain to tell you to breathe harder to try to get more oxygen in. And that's why many patients will uh, complain of shortness of breath, especially with exercise when those oxygen demands with the tissues increase. Another symptom is feeling cold all the time. And again, this has to do with a decreased level of metabolism. You need hemoglobin to be delivered to the cells in order to essentially fire up those cells to metabolize carbohydrates and fats and to keep the cellular uh, uh, energy going. So with decreased oxygen delivery, less metabolism, less heat is generated, and the patient will have a sensation of being cold. Dizziness, lightheadedness, and loss of concentration are due to the decreased oxygen delivery to the brain. Obviously, that there are other conditions that can cause some more symptoms, such as low blood pressure and certain infections. But again, this uh, compounds uh, those other diseases, and certainly in the presence of some of these other symptoms of anemia, makes the diagnosis uh, more likely. 
Chest pain, especially with exercise, has to do with decreased oxygen delivery to the heart muscle. So this can occur in patients who have not had previous uh, evidence of coronary disease or cardiac disease. Uh, in fact, they, it could occur in patients who have normal hearts and normal coronary arteries, but certainly if the cardiac muscle demands outstrip the ability of the lower hemoglobin level to deliver oxygen, then the patient will get a chest pain symptom that is similar to patients who have a narrowing of one of the coronary arteries. And finally, pale skin. One of the reasons that your skin, if you're Caucasian, uh, is, has kind of a pink color is the fact that you have hemoglobin in the capillaries that feed the skin, which to a certain extent is visible from the outside. So if you have a lower hemoglobin level because you're anemic, that's less of this red pigment that's delivered to close to the surface where you can see it. And as a result, uh, patients will have a pale uh, complexion, which again, in conjunction with these other symptoms, is strongly suggestive of anemia. Next slide, please. So if you have these symptoms, does it always mean that you have anemia? And the answer clearly is no. As I suggested in the previous slide, almost all of the symptoms that we discussed in that previous slide are nonspecific and can be seen with many other diseases, such as the ones that I mentioned. The only way to make the diagnosis of anemia for sure is to do a blood test that measures the hemoglobin level. And the diagnosis we said is made if you're a woman and have a hemoglobin less than 12, or you're a man and you have a hemoglobin less than 13. Now, even if you have a lower than normal hemoglobin, it doesn't necessarily mean that these symptoms are due to anemia. So your physician should look at the symptoms as a whole and see whether or not that pattern might be suggestive of another illness. Kidney disease itself, even without, uh, not, without anemia, can cause many of those symptoms. Other conditions such as liver disease, heart disease, can lead to a sense of fatigue. Infections, obviously, the last time you had the flu, you probably had a low energy level and you were very tired, but that didn't necessarily mean you were anemic. So it's important that you discuss each of these symptoms with your doctor, who will then do the appropriate evaluation and decide whether or not additional diagnoses need to be considered. Next slide. So what about the relationship between chronic kidney disease and anemia? Obviously, there's a relationship because this is the American Kidney Fund, and you're hearing a lecture about anemia, which is directed to many of you who have kidney disease. So we're discussing this because there clearly is a connection. So as we said at the very beginning of the presentation, anemia is extremely common in patients with chronic kidney disease and can occur even in very early stages, such as stage two CKD, where many of the other complications of chronic kidney disease are not yet apparent. So it's important uh, if you do have kidney disease to discuss uh, whether or not you should be tested for anemia, even if you don't have symptoms. Because as I said before, many of the symptoms that occur in patients with anemia are more obvious if there's been a more sudden fall in hemoglobin levels. And if the fall is very gradual, your body may compensate and you may not even know that you're anemic. It's recommended that patients with stage three or greater CKD, even if they're not symptomatic from anemia, should have a hemoglobin test at least once a year to screen for the presence of anemia. And again, even if symptoms are not present, it may be appropriate, again, given the particular patient's situation, uh, to treat the anemia uh, to prevent other complications from occurring. Next slide, please. So this shows you, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, that the prevalence of anemia increases dramatically with the stage of CKD. For those of you who remember how these stages of CKD are uh, defined, they're defined by your glomerular filtration rate which is determined uh, from a formula that incorporates your serum creatinine level. So there's a blood test. It also incorporates your age, your gender, and your race. And by that calculation, we get what's called an estimated GFR or EGFR. If your EGFR is 60 to 90, that's stage two. If your EGFR is 30 to 60, that's stage three. If your EFR, EGFR is 15 to 30, you're stage four. And if your EGFR is less than, than 15, that's considered stage five. And many of those patients will be starting on dialysis soon if they haven't done so already. And if you look at the extreme right side of the slide, you can see 
that for patients who have stage 5 CKD, EGFR less than 15, or they're on dialysis, about 90% of them will have anemia based on the, those thresholds that I already mentioned, hemoglobin less than 12 in women and less than 13 in men. Next slide, please. So does everybody get anemia at the same time when they have progressive CKD? And the answer is no. Uh, anemia is going to be more likely to occur if you have certain other conditions or demographics. If you have diabetes as the cause of your kidney disease, or even not as the cause of your kidney disease, you have kidney disease from something else and you also happen to have diabetes, the diabetes can independently contribute to the severity of the anemia. If you have heart disease, then that affects your ability to you know, pump blood to your bone marrow where the red cells are made, so that can also adversely affect uh, your ability to make red blood cells and contribute to the anemia. If you have high blood pressure compared to patients who have normal blood pressure at any given stage of chronic kidney disease, you're more likely to have anemia. Interestingly, if you're African American, and these are based on epidemiologic studies, the mechanism of which is not clearly understood, there may be some genes in the African American population that lead to more anemia at any given level of kidney function, and there's certainly conditions among African Americans that can independently lead to anemia, such as sickle cell disease or thalassemia, but again, this is also a compounding risk factor. And finally, if you're over 75, and set patients who are over 75, even without chronic kidney disease, are often anemic just because their bone marrow is as old as the rest of their body, and old bone marrows just don't make red cells effectively as people with young bone marrows. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the mechanism by which CKD causes anemia is twofold. First is the deficiency of a hormone called erythropoietin. And erythropoietin is a hormone that is made by normal kidneys. It senses the oxygen delivery to the kidney tissue. And if the oxygen delivery goes down, then the kidney is stimulated to make erythropoietin. This is a hormone that travels through the bloodstream, gets to the bone marrow, and tells the bone marrow, signals the bone marrow, to make more red blood cells so that the oxygen delivery to the kidney gets restored back to or towards normal. So basically, it's a feedback mechanism, less oxygen delivery, more erythropoietin, stimulate more red cells, more oxygen delivery, and basically keeps your hemoglobin at a normal level under the circumstances if you have normal kidneys. If you don't have normal kidneys, then the ability of your diseased kidneys is affected, the, the ability to make erythropoietin. So the erythropoietin signal to the bone marrow is decreased. The bone marrow makes less or fewer red blood cells, and that results in anemia. The second major contributor to anemia in patients with chronic kidney disease is iron deficiency. And we'll talk about iron deficiency in a, in a few minutes, but many, if not most patients with chronic kidney disease and anemia have both the erythropoietin deficiency and iron deficiency, which as you will see, requires replacement of both agents often at the same time. Next slide, please. So as I just explained, erythropoietin is a hormone made by normal kidneys to make uh, the bone marrow produce more red blood cells as kidney function declines, less erythropoietin is, is, is able to be made by the kidneys and as a result, the bone marrow does not get the signal to make more red cells, and the hemoglobin level goes down. Next slide, please. So just a little bit about normal red blood cell physiology. Normal red blood cells live somewhere between 115 and 120 days. That's four months. Okay, but unfortunately, in patients with chronic kidney disease, the red blood cell lifespan is less than normal. So now you have two problems that affect your hemoglobin or your red cell number. One is the fact that you have less erythropoietin stimulating your bone marrow to make new red blood cells, and at the same time, the red blood cells don't live as long. So those two factors also contribute to the anemia. Now the body always is going to need to make new red blood cells to replace those that have died because they're just too old or that have been lost due to bleeding, 
So in patients who are on dialysis, for instance, they're not only having a lower, a shorter red cell lifespan, but they're also losing red blood cells from their body because of blood left in the dialyzer circuit or bleeding from their needle sites at the end of the treatment, et cetera. So this would require an even higher than normal level of erythropoietin to stimulate the bone marrow to make new red blood cells to replace these many causes of red cell loss and shorten lifespan. So you have the two compounding factor now that the diseased kidney can't even make a normal amount of erythropoietin, never mind the increased amount of erythropoietin that a normal person would make in response to the loss of red blood cells from the body or a shortened red blood cell lifespan. Next slide, please. So ultimately, if you're unable to make sufficient EPO to stimulate your bone marrow to keep the hemoglobin level normal, then the, the hemoglobin level will go down and ultimately fewer red cells, less hemoglobin will be available to deliver oxygen to your tissues and you will have the symptoms of anemia that we have discussed. Next slide. So this is a diagram that kind of summarizes what happens to you if you have chronic kidney disease. Over on the left side of the slide, you can see what happens in a patient with normal kidney function, two nice shiny kidneys doing their job, making normal or even higher amounts of erythropoietin is needed to keep the hemoglobin level normal, despite shortened red cell lifespan or loss of red cells from the body. And as you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, you have a normal red number of red blood cells, you have a normal amount of hemoglobin, this delivers adequate amount of oxygen to your tissues, and you feel just great. Next slide. This happens in the setting of chronic kidney disease. So those kidneys are now diseased. Those little pock marks on the kidneys show that the kidney function is abnormal. As a result, you instead of having three drops of EPO in this particular illustration, you only have one drop of EPO in the middle of the slide. And as a result, you have a fewer uh, red blood cells, a less hemoglobin to deliver oxygen to your tissues. If you recall, the previous slide on the right-hand slide had five red blood cells in that little pathway. Now you have only two red blood cells in the pathway, less hemoglobin, less oxygen delivery, more symptoms of anemia. Next slide, please. Now, what about iron deficiency? We said this is a very important factor that contributes to anemia in patients with chronic kidney disease. What is iron? I'm sure you've all heard about iron. It's a supplement uh, that's in most uh, uh, vitamin and mineral supplements, and it's a mineral in many, many foods. If you eat red meat, uh, I personally love steaks. Uh, the redness in the meat is actually the iron that's contained uh, in the blood that's left in, uh, in the tissue that you're eating. So it sounds a little gross, but I mean, that's how uh, many of us get our dietary iron. So iron is an essential component of hemoglobin. It is at the core of every hemoglobin molecule. So if you don't have adequate iron being delivered to the bone marrow, even if there's sufficient erythropoietin, you're not gonna be able to make hemoglobin and make new red blood cells because you just don't have all the building blocks that are necessary to make the molecule and to make the cells. And as a result of iron deficiency, you get anemic. As it turns out, as we mentioned, iron deficiency is very common in patients with chronic kidney disease due to not enough dietary iron intake, as well as in the dialysis patient, those sources of ongoing blood loss that I already mentioned, including blood loss in the dialyzer circuit, oozing from needle sites, all the blood testing that we do, vascular access procedures, et cetera. Next slide, please. So why does the iron intake, the dietary iron, and patients with CKD go down. Well, the normal sources of dietary iron, as we said, are red meats and green leafy vegetables like spinach uh, and lettuce and all those things in your, in your salad, okay? Many patients with chronic kidney disease, both on and not on dialysis, will eat less of these foods because of dietary restrictions and inadequate financial resources. Steaks are not cheap. Red meat is not cheap, and many patients, both with non-dialysis and, non and dialysis CKD, just don't have adequate resources to be able to have a steak every night or even a hamburger, and as a result, their overall dietary intake of iron goes down. 
even with proper dietary iron intake. Suppose you have lots of money and you go to a steakhouse every night and you eat a nice salad and a, a filet mignon, et cetera, and you have a normal amount of iron in your diet. If you have chronic kidney disease, your ability to absorb that iron may be significantly impaired. So it's not just about the, about the iron that's going in to your gastrointestinal tract, it's the ability of your gastrointestinal tract to absorb that iron. And unfortunately, many patients with chronic kidney disease and a majority of patients who are on dialysis have inflammation because of the kidney disease itself, because of intercurrent infections, because of foreign bodies like dialysis catheters that are sitting in their bloodstream. And this leads to the production of a hormone that decreases the ability to absorb oral iron, whether it's in your food or whether it's in an iron supplement. So this makes it very difficult for us as your healthcare providers to provide adequate oral iron, even with oral iron supplements, to overcome that impairment in gastrointestinal iron absorption. And as a result, many of, the, of you will become iron deficient. Next slide. So what about the blood loss? We've already mentioned the major sources of blood loss that occur in patients on dialysis. The blood left in the dialyzer circuit, even with a great rinse back, you're still gonna have a small amount, maybe a, a tablespoon of iron that's left uh, in the dialyzer circuit. The blood testing that we do to make sure that your hemoglobin is normal, your KTORV is normal, your calcium, your phosphorus, your PTH is normal. You know, this all adds up even though the tubes individually don't contain a lot of blood in the aggregate over the course of a month or course of the year, this can lead to a significant blood loss. The oozing from the needle sites following the dialysis uh, can be a, a teaspoon or even a tablespoonful. Again, in the aggregate over many, many dialysis treatments, uh, this can lead to significant iron deficiency. <clears throat> and as we said, vascular access procedures. Every time you do a thrombectomy on a fistula or you put in a new catheter, there's always going to be a certain amount of blood loss. And again, it may be minimal with a single procedure, but in the aggregate and added to all these other sources of blood loss, a typical dialysis patient loses about four pints of blood per year. I mean, that's giving away blood that would be four transfusions worth. So that's a lot of blood over the course of a year. Next slide. So in addition, patients with CKD, even if they're not on dialysis, may have blood loss due to the factors that you can see on this slide. Many patients with chronic kidney disease have blood clotting abnormalities that may be compounded by the fact that they're told to take, take an aspirin every day to decrease the risk of heart attack or stroke. You know, those things that decrease your blood clotting for a good reason, such as heart and brain protection from stroke and heart attack can be bad for you if you have uh, a lesion that causes bleeding. If you have a cut, if you have an ulcer, you have anything that bleeds, you're going to bleed even more because of your chronic kidney disease itself, which impairs blood clotting, and because of these additional medications that are designed to impair blood clotting, uh, but can have a, take a toll in terms of bleeding. There's a greater incidence of gastrointestinal ulcers and other abnormalities in the GI tract among patients with chronic kidney disease that also can bleed. And of course, if you undergo any kind of surgical procedure, placement of an AV fistula or graft or any other thing, anything else like you need a, a gallbladder removal or whatever happens to many patients with or without chronic kidney disease, the chances are that your bleeding will be greater because the chronic kidney disease and the Toxins that build up in the blood can impair blood clotting. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so how do we treat anemia in chronic kidney disease patients? Well, first we make the diagnosis. The low hemoglobin level confirms that the patient does have anemic. The first thing we do is to test for the presence of iron deficiency. Because iron deficient anemia is the easiest anemia to treat and may actually bring the hemoglobin back towards normal, even without the need for an erythropoietin type drug. So the two tests that we use to test for iron deficiency are, you can see on this slide, the transferrin saturation, which is a measure of the iron circulating in the blood, and the ferritin, 
which is a measure of the iron stored in the body. And it's very useful for us to have both of these tests in combination to give us a picture of whether it's an absolute iron deficiency, which means that both the transferrin and the ferritin are low. And a low amount of iron in the body, which is most likely to respond to supplemental iron. On the other hand, if the transferrin saturation is low, low amount of iron in the blood, but the ferritin, the storage iron is high, then this suggests an inflammatory condition, as I mentioned before, where the ability to absorb iron from the GI tract, as well as the ability to release irons from the, iron from the cells that store it is impaired, and that may be more difficult to treat with just oral iron. Next slide, please. So an iron deficient diagnosis is made if the transferrin saturation is less than 20 or the ferritin is less than 100. In either of those situations, we say the patient has a lower than normal amount of iron in their body, and by replacing that iron, there's a very good chance that the hemoglobin will rise, and often it will rise to a sufficient degree that it will improve the symptoms of anemia. If the patient has a severe iron deficiency, and I personally define a severe iron deficiency as a transferrin saturation less than 10, remember iron deficiency is less than 20, I call it severe less than 10, then it is such a level of iron deficiency that it's unlikely that oral iron supplements will be adequate to replace the iron, and that patient might be a candidate for an intravenous iron supplement. Certainly, if the patient has iron deficiency, has tried oral iron supplements in the past and cannot tolerate them because of pain in the stomach, because of constipation, et cetera, then obviously giving that patient more oral iron supplements does more harm than good. And again, that patient would be a candidate for intravenous iron. Next slide. So for patients who do not respond to oral iron supplements, the reason, again, being the inflammation decreases their ability to absorb even therapeutic amounts of iron. There's a high incidence of adverse reactions to the doses of oral iron that are required, generally three tablets of something like ferrous sulfate or another over-the-counter type of iron causing nausea and constipation. And with very severe levels of iron deficiency, we generally turn to intravenous forms of iron. Next slide. So that ultimately, the goal of iron therapy is to increase the transferrin saturation to that 20 to 30% range, but not necessarily to normalize the hemoglobin level. Many patients who receive sufficient iron to raise the transferrin saturation will raise the hemoglobin level by about one point, okay? So if they are starting at 10 and they have iron deficiency and we give them enough iron to get that transferrin saturation, in the 20 to 30 percent, then that might get their hemoglobin up to 11. Still not normal, but often sufficient to significantly reduce those symptoms of fatigue and lack of energy and shortness of breath, et cetera. There is a new oral iron product called ferric citrate that does seem to be more effective at having fewer side effects than the typical over-the-counter iron preparations like ferrous sulfate but it is more expensive and requires a prescription. So if your doctor tells you, especially if you're non-dialysis, you're CKD, not on dialysis, that you have iron deficiency and he wants to put you on a trial of oral iron, you may want to discuss the option of ferric citrate as opposed to the over-the-counter iron preparations because the ferric citrate does seem to be a more effective, but it's at a cost. Patients who fail a one to three month trial of oral iron therapy, uh, or those who fall into those categories that I mentioned before, with severe iron deficiency, or who have had poor tolerance for, I, for oral iron products in the past, they may be candidates for intravenous iron. Next slide, please. All right, so what about intravenous iron in CKD patients who are not on dialysis? You generally have to go to an infusion center, and the dose of intravenous iron is administered over about 30 minutes. These infusion centers may be part of your nephrologist practice, 
or your nephrologist may not offer this particular service and they may refer you to a hematology infusion center or whatever infusion center happens to have a relationship with your nephrologist. The number of treatments that you have to go to the infusion center to get an adequate dose of IV iron depends upon, <coughs> excuse me, the particular IV iron preparation that's used. So some of these preparations require four to five uh, 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 infusions, that's with the older agents, but the newer iron agents may require only one or two infusions. So again, this is something that you may want to discuss with your doctor to per perhaps request one of these newer agents that requires fewer infusions, which not only means less trips for you, but also means less times that somebody has to stick a needle in your arm. And if you're progressing towards dialysis, the last thing that you want to do is to abuse your veins and leave fewer options available for the placement of an AV fistula sometime down the road. The total iron dose that's generally given, which is about one gram of iron, uh, again, it depends upon the particular agent, how many infusions you need to get to that one gram, will generally raise your hemoglobin by one point. And I use the example here from a hemoglobin of 10 to a hemoglobin of 11. Again, we're not normalizing the hemoglobin level, but we're getting it up to a sufficient degree that many of the symptoms of the anemia may be decreased. Next slide, please. So for, pa for CKD patients who are on dialysis, generally oral iron patients are pretty much never effective. There's very, very few of any patients that I treat with oral iron on dialysis for two reasons. Number one, they have those ongoing blood losses that we talked about, less blood left in the dialyzer circuit, oozing from needle sites, frequent blood testing, that lead to a degree of iron loss and deficiency that just cannot be overcome with oral iron agents, even with the ferric citrate that we mentioned is often effective in non-dialysis patients. So almost all dialysis patients who are iron deficient will get intravenous iron, which is given through the dialysis circuit. So in general, you don't even know that it's getting in there. You know, you may discuss it with your nurse or your nephrologist. You see this bag of red stuff that's going into your circuit. That's the iron. But again, it generally does not cause any discomfort. It does not require a needle stick because it's already going through the circuit that's being dialyzed. And as a result, most patients don't even know that they're getting it. In the United States, about 80% of hemodialysis patients are on a regular IV iron program to replace all that iron loss, as I mentioned, through those various sources. Next slide. So ultimately, we have two goals of treating dialysis patients, hemodialysis patients with iron. Number one is to prevent iron deficiency, because we know it will inevitably occur, given all those iron losses that we talked about, again, blood left in the circuit, oozing from neocytes, frequent blood testing. But also, we also may need to correct a pre-existing iron deficiency. And as we said, many patients who have had CKD and then progressed to needing dialysis, they've been iron deficient for a while. They start on dialysis already iron deficient, so many of those patients will require a higher IV iron dose at the outset of dialysis to replace a pre-existing iron deficiency, and then they require ongoing intravenous iron, <coughs> excuse me, to replace the ongoing iron losses that we discussed. The repletion portion of that iron therapy, if you develop actual iron deficiency, you're generally going to get eight to 10 larger doses of iron, again, infused into your dialysis circuit, usually during 10 consecutive hemodialysis treatments. On the other hand, if the goal of the iron therapy is to anticipate and prevent iron deficiency from occurring because of those ongoing iron losses, then the dose is smaller it's, and it's given less frequently. And typically those patients will get a dose of IV iron once every one or two weeks, not every treatment. Next slide. So what about side effects? Every drug has side effects and intravenous iron is no exception. The major side effects associated with intravenous iron 
depends upon the preparation used. For those larger doses of intravenous iron that I mentioned are used in non-dialysis patients, where you go to an infusion center and get one of those larger doses, the major adverse reactions tend to be allergic type reactions. So it's recommended that those infusion centers have the equipment available in case you get a severe allergic reaction. Now these allergic reactions are very, very rare, but if they do occur, they can be serious. For the forms of intravenous iron that are used in dialysis patients, again, it's a different, generally a different chemical. It's given a much smaller dose, more frequently than what we do in patients who are not on dialysis. And the major side effects of those agents is not allergic. It's actually more in the way of nausea, vomiting, and low blood pressure. So again, if you have these kinds of symptoms, bring them to the attention of your dialysis doctor or nurse, and they be able to perhaps give you a different iron preparation that decreases the likelihood that you'll get these symptoms. The side effects of intravenous iron, irrespective of the agent used, are generally less if you use a smaller dose and you infuse it over a long period of time. And again, most dialysis providers are aware of this and they tend to uh, give the lowest dose that the patient will tolerate over the longest period of time during the dialysis treatment. Next slide. Now let's turn back to the replacement of that deficient hormone erythropoietin. If an anemic patient with chronic kidney disease does not have iron deficiency or another identifiable cause of anemia, then we basically assume that the anemia is due to erythropoietin deficiency. We do not get erythropoietin levels to confirm this. It's pretty much assumed and uh, we call it a no-brainer. That's just basically what's likely to be going on. Now, there are several forms of erythropoietin replacement drugs that are available on the market. And again, the choice of the particular drug should be discussed between you and your nephrologist or your dialysis provider, because each of these drugs has a little different properties, although they all pretty much achieve the same goal, which is to replace the deficient erythropoietin and to raise the hemoglobin to a level that decreases symptoms, but is not necessarily in the normal range. Erythropoietin replacement hormone <coughs> can be given either intravenously, typically during the dialysis procedure for a hemodialysis patient, or subcutaneously under the skin if the patient is not on hemodialysis, and that includes non-dialysis CKD patients or patients who are on perineal dialysis, for example. Next slide. Now, we have to be very conservative on this, the amount of erythropoietin that we use because it's been noted in a number of clinical studies that high doses of erythropoietin can cause cardiovascular events, especially stroke. So the Food and Drug Administration has a black box warning on all these erythropoietin drugs that says they can only be initiated when the hemoglobin is less than 10 and that they need to be decreased or discontinued when the hemoglobin glows above 10 in non-dialysis patients and above 11 in dialysis patients. So very, very conservative erythropoietin dosing uh, has been dictated by the FDA. Next slide, please. So these are the various forms of erythropoietin on the market. The shortest acting form is erythropoietin or epoetin alpha, and this is identical to the drug or the hormone made by the kidneys. It has to be given on a more frequent basis. It's usually given three times a week in hemodialysis patients, and every one to two weeks in non-dialysis patients. Darby poetin represents a tweaking of the erythropoietin molecule that extends its duration of action so it's generally given every week in dialysis patients and every two to four weeks in non-hemodialysis patients. And then the newest one, it's a mouthful, methoxy polyethylene glycol, epoetin beta, is the longest acting of the erythropoietin drugs and is generally given once a month uh, after a two-week initiation period. Next slide, please. So on not, uh, in CKD patients who are not on in-center dialysis, Again, this has to be injected under the skin. The frequency of administration depends 
upon the agent used. Medicare, unfortunately, does not allow for self-administration of erythropoietin hormones at home in non-dialysis patients. So the patient must go to a clinic to get the injection, but other forms of insurance do allow for self-injection of erythropoietin at home by the patient or by a helper if you can't give it to yourself. Next slide. So for patients who are on in or dialysis where you have the blood circuit that you can inject things into without any discomfort to the patient, just like we talked about with IV iron, we generally give the erythropoietin through the dialysis circuit. There are some dialysis facilities that give it subcutaneously because it does seem to be a little more effective when given under the skin, but the trade-off for that is the discomfort that may occur. Ultimately, the dose of erythropoietin is adjusted every month to keep the hemoglobin level within the target range of between 10 or 12. And there is a small percentage of patients about 15% at any given time that will not be able to achieve the target hemoglobin level despite enough erythropoietin and iron replacement. And those are challenging patients. They usually have a high burden of inflammation and often we just cannot get their uh, hemoglobin levels to target no matter what we try. Next slide. So red blood cell transfusions are kind of the last resort for those patients who do not respond to adequate doses of erythropoietin and iron therapy. But even patients who are responding may have sources of blood loss, like a gastrointestinal bleed, that trigger a blood transfusion. The hemoglobin level below which most physicians and caregivers will be tempted to administer a transfusion is around seven, uh, but this varies tremendously by the physician as well as the other conditions that may be affecting the patients. And we tend to be conservative in our use of transfusions because they can sensitize you to other people's proteins, which decreases your ability uh, to get a future kidney transplant from a pool of deceased donors. Uh, and there's also obviously the risk of blood transfusion reactions and a very, very small risk of infection. Next slide. There are some new treatments for anemia that are being developed, which are very exciting. They basically replace erythropoietin shots, either intravenous or subcutaneously, with an orally administered agent that stimulates the kidney and other tissues in the body to make sufficient erythropoietin to stimulate the bone marrow to raise the hemoglobin level. So you might be saying, well, Dr. Wish said earlier that erythropoietin is made in the kidney and loss of the kidney function decreases erythropoietin. Well, that is true under normal circumstances, but in the presence of these new drugs, you can get erythropoietin production by non-kidney tissues, particularly the liver, and this can be sufficient to raise the hemoglobin level to that same target range of 10 to 12 that we generally use with the conventional erythropoietin agents. It's hoped that some of these, or the first of these new drugs, will be available just next year in 2020. Next slide. So that is, my, that is my final slide, and I'd be very, very happy to answer any questions you might have in the, in the remaining 10 or so minutes. Thank you for your attention. And thank you, Dr. Wish, for joining us and leading such an excellent webinar. So at this time, um, I'll ask you some of the questions that we received over the course of the webinar. Um, so the first one, uh, we got a couple of questions from people with kidney transplants. Um, so can you discuss the prevalence and causes of anemia in kidney transplant patients? And additionally, um, somebody said, I received a deceased donor kidney transplant but still have anemia. Why would that be? Is it because I received a, de a deceased donor kidney instead of a living donor kidney? Okay, that's a very, very good question. As far as I'm aware, and again, I'm not a transplant specialist, I'm more of a dialysis nephrologist, but my understanding is that there should be no difference between a deceased donor kidney and a living donor kidney in terms of its ability to make erythropoietin if the kidney function is normal, okay? The main reason why patients who have transplants get anemic before the kidney function declines, and in most transplants, it will eventually decline to the point 
just like anybody else with chronic kidney disease, they get anemia because their GFR goes below, say, 60, is the immunosuppressive drugs that are required to prevent rejection. Many of these immunosuppressive drugs downregulate wide blood cell production to make you more tolerant of the foreign tissue and prevent rejection. And sometimes that decrease in white blood cell production by the bone marrow spills over to decrease red blood cell production as well. It's not the primary objective of therapy, but the specificity of these drugs in terms of downregulating cellular production can, as I said, sometimes spill over. The agent that seems to be most responsible for this spillover effect is sirolimus. So if you're on sirolimus and you're very anemic, you may want to talk to your doctor about the possibility of lowering the dose of sirolimus or getting you off the sirolimus altogether and substituting an alternate immunosuppressive drug. Thank you for that great explanation. Um, so our next question is, what can you do if you are unable to take iron supplement supplementation for whatever reason? If you're unable to tolerate oral iron supplements and you are by the tests that we mentioned, low transferrin saturation and or low ferritin, and you're anemic obviously, then really the only option at that point is to administer the iron intravenously. So if you're a non-dialysis patient, as I said, your, di your doctor will probably, or I hope will choose one of the currently available intravenous iron preparations that will give you sufficient iron to correct the iron deficiency, and that can be administered in either one or two visits to the infusion center. Okay, thank you for that answer. Um, so next up, we have a question from a peritoneal dialysis patient, and they ask, do PD patients experience less blood loss than hemodialysis patients? Absolutely. Peritoneal dialysis patients have significantly less blood loss than hemodialysis patients because there's no blood left in the dialyzer circuit. There's no oozing from the needle sites because there's no needles, and the amount of blood that's drawn for testing uh, tends to be less in peritoneal dialysis patients. Uh, so for all those reasons, with less blood loss, the severity of the anemia tends to be less. And even though our target hemoglobin level is the same for perineal dialysis patients, it's 10 to 12, the amount of erythropoietin and the amount of iron that is required to achieve the target hemoglobin level is significantly less. And that's particularly true for the iron because of the ongoing iron losses being such, so, so much lower, the iron requirements for dialysis uh, for perineal dialysis patients are significantly less than they are for hemodialysis patients. Okay, so great. Um, so going off that question, another question from a PD patient, uh, they asked, is there a clinical reason for going straight to IV iron instead of oral? Well, as I said before, the ability to replace oral iron in hemodialysis patients or the, the ability to correct iron deficiency in hemodialysis patients is a losing battle. It just is not sufficient, and there's sufficient inflammation that impairs the absorption of most oral iron preparations. So we go directly to intravenous iron. We don't even give a trial. In perineal dialysis patients, it is not unreasonable with a mild to moderate degree of iron deficiency to try an oral iron supplement first, okay? And that it's recommended that that be for maybe one to three months to check on the uh, uh, the efficacy, the you know the ability of the drug to correct the iron blood test, as well as the tolerability. Because remember, in order to correct iron deficiency with the conventional oral iron supplements like ferrous sulfate, you need three pills a day. Those pills have to be administered either one hour before or two hours after a meal, so they don't interfere with the food and they can cause a variety of side effects that we mentioned in terms of abdominal pain and constipation. So given all of those hoops to jump through, most patients do not generally take the prescribed dose of the oral iron, therefore the oral iron tends to be inadequate to correct the iron deficiency, and in most patients, IV iron ends up being used anyway. But as I said, it's not unreasonable in a perineal dialysis patient because you don't have those ongoing iron losses that a hemodialysis patient has to try a one to three month course of oral iron 
to see whether or not it works. Great. So going off that, and you actually alluded to the answer to this question earlier, but I'll still ask the question for the group. Uh, what are examples of adverse reactions to iron supplementation? Uh, are we talking oral or intravenous? Both. Or both? Both. Okay. We, we talked about the oral iron adverse reactions being upset stomach and constipation. Those are the two big ones. Of course, it also turns your stool black, but that doesn't hurt you, but it can be sometimes you know, a little creepy. All right, so those are the main things with oral iron. And again, you have those hoops that you have to jump through in terms of not taking it with a meal to maximize its absorption, and then the inevitable consequence that in many patients it doesn't work. With IV iron preparations, the major side effects are dependent upon the nature of the IV iron, how it's packaged, so to speak. Iron itself is very toxic when administered intravenously, free iron, okay? So all the therapeutic iron preparations, the products, have to wrap that iron in a carbohydrate jacket to prevent the release of significant amounts of free iron into the blood after it's injected. So the side effects of the IV iron have to do with how effective that jacket is in preventing the release of free iron into the blood. Think of these preparations as being a Tootsie Roll Pop. Okay, for those of you who remember Tootsie Roll Pops, you have the chewy center, which is the iron, and then you have the candy coating, which is the carbohydrate that envelops the iron. It's a tiny particle, it gets into the blood, and basically what happens is that your macrophages, which are the cells in your blood that eat stuff, they basically take the iron into their cell and then release the iron intracellularly so it doesn't cause any toxic reaction with the blood, okay? The types of iron that are given in dialysis patients have more free iron, and therefore we have to minimize the dose that's given at any particular time to minimize the side effects. So that's why if you're getting venifer, uh, iron sucrose, or iron gluconate, which is prolicid in your dialysis unit, you generally won't get more than 100 or 125 milligrams at a time. On the other hand, if you're a non-dialysis patient or you're a perineal dialysis patient and you're coming to a clinic, you want to minimize the number of visits, so you need a different kind of iron that doesn't have any free iron. And that is the newer products such as iron carboxymaltose, which is called Injectifer, or, uh, or uh, another one called Ferlicit, and those are wrapped better, okay? There's very, very little, if any, free iron, and as a result, most of the reactions to those drugs, which are, are given in a much higher doses in a single sitting, are not due to the free iron, but they're due to the allergic reactions that may occur to the carbohydrate coating. And if those allergic reactions can sometimes be severe, and that's why, as I said, it can have to do with low blood pressure, shortness of breath, you know, a feeling of like you got a bee sting, that kind of allergic reaction. And therefore, we have to take those much more seriously and have the appropriate resuscitative equipment available in those settings. I hope that answers the question. Great, thank you for that explanation. Um, so we're gonna transition to, very quickly to some questions about anemia and heart disease. Um, so the first one is, does the chest pain associated with anemia feel similar to angina? Yes, it can, okay, because it's pretty much the same mechanism because you're not delivering enough oxygen to the heart muscle. So with angina, the problem is a blockage in one of the coronary arteries that leads to decreased blood flow beyond that blockage. And again, the heart reacts by causing chest pain. In the setting of anemia, the, the, pretty much it's the same mechanism. You have decreased delivery of oxygen to the heart muscle. It's not because of a blockage in a coronary artery. It's because of the low hemoglobin level but the mechanism is the same, and the nature of the pain is often the same, and can also, like angina, be precipitated by exercise or anything that increases the demand for oxygen by the heart muscle. Thank you for that. Um, and our last question this afternoon, um, how does the anemia affect A1C results? How does the anemia of, of what, I'm sorry, how does anemia affect A1C results? Oh, okay. All right. So it can affect the, uh, the A1C result because it's hemoglobin that's, car that's uh, carboxylated. So if your hemoglobin level is lower, then it can affect the amount of hemoglobin that gets carboxylated. So uh, 
uh, ultimately, remember, it's a percentage of hemoglobin that has the carboxylation on it. And if you have lower hemoglobin levels and a given amount of glucose, a greater percentage of the hemoglobin could therefore be carboxylated because there's just less hemoglobin around. So you may have to correct the A1C level for the degree of anemia. Okay, so again, more anemic patients may have what I would call an artifactually higher A1C because there's less hemoglobin to carboxylate with the same amount of sugar in the blood. That means a greater percentage of the lower amount of hemoglobin gets carboxylated. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Wish, for answering all of these questions. Um, we really appreciate your time. And so this concludes today's webinar. Uh, our next webinar will be about nephrotic syndrome and FSGS. The webinar will be held on Tuesday, March 19th, and hosted by nephrotic syndrome expert, Dr. Kirk Campbell. Registration is now open. Visit kidneyfund.org slash webinars for more information and to register. When the webinar closes, please do not close your browser window. We, you may see a pop-up saying that the webinar has ended. Please close that pop-up and proceed to the webinar evaluation survey. Your honest feedback will help us to make our webinar program the best it can be. Thank you for joining, and we hope to see you again.